This week's sponsor, KR Couriers and Transport Limited, are best known as being a Northwest based company who deliver newspapers and magazines for local news agents and superstores. You'll find all the information within the description. Please give them a follow. Thank you. Hello everybody and welcome to the Billy Moore podcast and today's special guest is Ricky Killeen. Ricky, from Durham. From Durham, yeah, yeah, we're Stanley County, Durham. So you've got a bit of a story to tell, you've an author, yeah. behind bars, rootless fitness, you're the, um, there's a story behind this as well, isn't he? There is, mate, yeah. Well, let's start from the beginning, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I was born in Newcastle um, and at the time Elzig Rides was kicking off. Yeah, I was living with my mum and dad, my brother and sister, and uh, it was quite rough at the time, so I had family through in Stanley, which is about 10 miles away from Newcastle, so my mum and dad decided to move us back over there, because obviously it was rough at the time in Newcastle, thinking that we're going to have a better life for us and a better upbringing, yeah, and we moved over to South Stanley yeah, in County Durham, and that area was just as rough as the one that we'd moved from, so... Uh, Growing up around there, I was just getting into bits of mischief all the time. I was about five year old when we moved over there, um, and just knocking about the streets and that were there, looking up to older people, just getting into trouble all the time. I did read right that you you wanted to go to prison. That was your that was your yeah. goal. Your dad was a uh, was doing a twelve year sentence at the time, I believe. Yeah. Then he received a life sentence. Is that did, so? Yeah. So tell us a little bit about why. You wanted to go to prison because I'm getting the feeling it was all about uh, the closeness and, yeah. and getting back together. But what it was, uh, growing up like from the age of seven, I knew that my dad had already spent 14 years in prison. Yeah. And my next door neighbour was a bit into bits of bothering and stuff, and people that I looked up to had all been to prison. And I was growing up around people like that, and it was just like it wasn't a deterrent; it was like glorified. And there was like a bit of a badge of honour and everyone used to go on about it and like like I say with me dad, everyone wants to be like the dad, don't they? So uh, it's like looking up to the wrong sort of role models, looking back, you know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah, oh, as far back as I can remember being a kid, I wanted to go to prison, which is mad looking back now. But that was the mindset that I was in at the time. Yeah. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Like but, uh, being a kid, just being free out there. I'm wanting to go to jail. Yeah. But you did end up going to prison and received an IPP sentence, yeah. and we'll talk about that a little bit further on. Yeah. But tell us about, like, what contributed to you to going to jail. Like, see, so yeah, growing up in that neighbourhood, in that area that you stayed, it progressed on it when I got up to senior school from the age of 11, started drinking alcohol, being around drugs, I mean, the first time I seen drugs uh, being around them was when I was about seven, eight year old. There was people in the streets, like blokes, a lot older than me. Yeah. Just like, it was just out in the open. It was just the, the normal thing. So growing up around that sort of thing, it was just it was just destined to happen. You know, there was like no good role models. Everyone around us was doing something. And yeah, uh, like I say, when we went to the school, all like-minded lads knocking around with each other. We all ended up smoking cannabis. That's where it started, drinking alcohol, smoking cannabis on the weekends. Yeah, and then it progressed on to harder drugs, but it was just like party drugs. It was never like addicted to drugs. It was just like a recreational thing on the mm-hmm. weekend. But from the age of 11, all the way up to 20 when I actually went to prison, it was just all about drinking and getting off your head and taking drugs. Was there a lot of violence involved with the, was that? Goes hand in hand on it, the, the out going out and drinking drugs, especially in Newcastle, isn't yeah. it? And these bigger cities like Liverpool, Manchester, London, you know, there's a lot of violence involved as well, isn't it? There is, I am. Um, obviously, as that progressed, and then we started going out to clubs and different things, going into the local town every weekend, there was something happening, getting into bits of fights, yeah, yeah going into other areas because we've got like Stanley in concert, which is like two towns next to each other. 
So our concert lads coming down to Stanley, we'd be fighting Stanley, going up to concert, and it was just like, every weekend it was just becoming a normal thing. So we'd gone out having fights, but then things start escalating and getting into worse things. Tell us about that. What, what escalated and what went worse? Yeah, at the time, like I see, the path I was going down, I just didn't really give a fuck about anything. And I was gone, I knew what path I was going down. I remember, um, well, like I see, when we're out fighting, it was escalating, things were starting, because we were carrying weapons around with us. Mm. Yeah, from a young age as well, that's another thing. The way we grew up in that neighborhood, yeah, in that estate and that, it's like carrying, everyone was carrying knives, carrying knuckle dusters, and yeah. Uh, I remember it was when I was, well, I think I was about 18 year old. That's when I uh, got arrested for a few different violent offenses, but ended up going to court and different things and nothing came of that. Wasn't until uh, I was 20 year old, that's when I got the IPP. Mm. Yeah, I was at a house party and started having a bit of a scrap with one of the lads. And I've ended up hitting the lad, knocked him out and then attacked him with a bottle. Yeah, um, then the police was looking for us for that. That was a section eighty. I went and handed myself in, and I was even saying to the police in their uh, custody suite when I was getting processed, and that I was saying to them, "Look, I, I was admitted to them. I told them what, it was, what had happened. Tell them it was me." Yeah. And even when they were, release, were releasing us, I was saying to them, "Like, you need to lock us up. This is not. It's not going to stop here." I was actually wanting to get locked up, you know, because I knew I was going down the wrong way. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Two weeks before I was due to get sentenced for that, that's when the offence happened, what I got my IPP for. Um, what happened with that offence was another altercation with a different uh, male. I was with my friend and he'd actually rang us up, mouthing on down the phone, and I was just like thinking, like, who are you talking to, sort of thing. Yeah, 10 minutes later, I was at his house, kicked his door and ran in with a machete. The two of us uh, set about him in his house, chopped him up with a machete. I was on my toes for that for a couple of weeks. And I th it was a week before my 21st birthday. Yeah. I uh, went and had myself in. Yeah, and I got locked up, got remanded, and I was on my way to Cassington Young Offenders Prison. Yeah, I remember that, please. And that was, uh, that was my first taste of prison. But I remember it was a Friday afternoon on my way to prison. Most people would be like sitting in the back of the paddy wagon shitting themselves. I've, I was sitting in the back. I remember Galaxy Radio was on. I'm just bopping my head around, just thinking like, I'm on my way now, you know? Yeah, Galaxy like, Radio, I remember that. Uh, <laughs> being on them, being on them sweat boxes <laughs> when you're on Bruce, but different radio yeah. stations, Radio Viking, Radio Mook, and yeah. Galaxy Radio, it all comes back to me. <laughs> so tell the viewers out there what an IPP is, because that's what you were sentenced to, wasn't yeah. it? Which is an indefinite prison sentence. Well, like I see, if I got what I wish for in the end. Looking back, obviously, I wish I never got it. Yeah. But a, um, an IPP is a, an indefinite sentence for public protection. Um, and it's Can you a, explain what that means? What it means is it was kept for the most dangerous offenders. Um, instead of, because they couldn't give you a life sentence, you had to commit murder to get a, a life sentence or... Yeah you got like a discretionary life, but they brought the IPPs out, which is more or less the same as where it is. It's a life sentence. Um, they actually brought them out for nonsense. That's what the IPP was brought out for. But they also started giving them out to violent offenders and they give them out, they give them out too much. They were only supposed to bring them out for a thousand, a thousand people by a thousand cases. Yeah. And then they're dishing about 7,000 out. Um, and, so 7,000 life sentences, technically, basically, yeah. that they, were, they were given out. Did you ever come across any other IPPs on, on your travels? Yeah, I came across loads. It was where, um, obviously, after I'd been there, uh, when I spent my time in Cassington, I went into Durham uh, Men's Prison, and that's when I got sentenced when I was in Durham. And I remember in Durham, you've got, like, uh, outside of your pads, you've got a card up on the, on the door with your name on and your sentence on. Yeah. And uh, mine had on... 99 years so how did that feel when you see that well after all them years of wanting to go to prison and then actually 
seeing 99 euros on my door, I was like, fucking hell. You know, I was 21 like... 21 years old. 21 year old, first time in prison. Slam with 99 euros and just hearing the horror stories of people that had been in a while before me and lads that knew the system and the same like, oh, how long is your tariff? I got like a four year tariff. But the same like, oh. People had tariffs with you and like with two years <clears> tariffs <throat> and we're still in there 10 years later. Well, it's been, you know, I've seen, I know. Yeah. When I have went back in this time, back on a recall, there's, I've been out nearly 10 years and there's lads still sitting in there or 15 years ago. Some of them got like a 20 month tariff and they're still stuck there now and never even been out. How does that work? Getting a 20 month tariff on an IPP, 99 year sentence with hope at the end, you know, and you're still there 15 years later. It yeah. doesn't make sense, does it? Doesn't be absolutely. Obviously, they're not conforming whilst away. Yeah. Because, you know, it reflects on your behaviour. Did you reflect on on your crimes when you're away? Because you're 21, you're young, you've got an air of arrogance, we all have at that age. You yeah. go away, you know, you're on the landings, and, you know, especially Section 18s, you know. To have something like that, labelled with that, you feel a little bit, yeah, all right, oh. untouchable. You know, I'm not, a, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not this kind of grafter. I'm not that kind of grafter. It's a violence offence. But did you ever reflect and go, oh, fucking hell, I wish I hadn't done that. Or, wow, I could have took someone's life there. See, looking back now, I, do, I don't regret the prison time that I've done because it's yeah. made as a person I am new. Obviously, I regret my actions that led us to the prison. But looking back, like the path I was going down, like that time that I spent in prison, it did... I did change you know obviously I would have just been still stuck out doing the, exactly the same thing so do you think it saves your life oh I definitely sense? did yeah. I so like the people that I was associating with before I went to prison I got out five years later and they're still doing the same thing like still taking drugs still mm-hmm. drinking and just looking really old you know <laughs> as sad as it sounds right it was for me it was a, <laughs> it was a place of sanctuary at a young age because I was I was massively into addiction. I was I was committing crimes to fund a habit. I, I was like I was a wreck outside, I'd get arrested, I'd go in and I, like I rebuild myself because you get the gym, your little blue gym vest, you're down yeah. in the gym with your blue oh, shorts. <laughs> it's just you know, and you and you rebuild it becomes a bit of a health farm and I was on that cycle. So for me it kinda saved my life. But I also realised that the, the, the more I was going back and the longer I was in, the less I was living, you know, and I was yeah. losing out. Well, Is that what come out, it comes to you? Oh, definitely. That's, uh, like I say, it took us a good, it took a couple of years. It wasn't until I got here, because I went, I, sp- I was about, I spent about nearly a year in Durham, and then I got transferred over to Franklin Prison, yes, Maximum Security Prison. Yeah, that's it. And yeah, uh, big old prison, man, isn't it? It is, aye. It's like yeah. most of the mansion in it's worse than oh, that. It's, just, it's on the same level as that, Franklin. And, oh, aye. Franklin and a uh, what's the other one called? You've got like full Sutton Avenue and full. Whitemore. So, yeah, you've got all the dispersals, yeah. full Sutton, Long Latin, uh, Whitemore, Monster Mansion, what was Wakefield, that? Wakefield, that was it. Yeah, yeah, you've got yeah. that was with um, to where the whole Charlie Bronson and, and Peter Morsley. Yeah. And they were there. So did you ever so what was your time? You know, you're a con now, you're in you're in Franklin it's it's, it's you know, I've heard I've heard some stories about the dispersals yeah. and the violence that goes on in there. Because people haven't got much to lose, have they? Yeah. So what was it like for you? See what it was like for me, another thing like I used to look up to gangsters and different things and obviously when you're young and you're watching the films, you're listening to rap music yeah. and you're taking it all in. And then, <clears throat> because I was still only 21, when I went to Franklin, most people would have been, again, like, shiting themselves going into somewhere like that. But for me, I went in there and I was, like... Fascinated. Probably fascinated. I was thinking, like, I've always wanted to go to prison. And then stepping into Franklin was, like, something... It was, like, fucking being in Disneyland. <laughs> that was the mindset I was in. I was like, fucking hell, I'm loving it. Yeah. You know, most people here. Oh my God, prison. you just turned up in Franklin, <laughs> one of the worst specials in the UK, one of the most violent. Yeah. And it's like Disneyland to you. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? And then, yeah, 
I'll tell you, like the first, it was the second day I was there, yeah, someone that I knew in there took us in the kitchen, we're cooking a steak and all that, because obviously you can cook your own food in there. Um, and just some, there was a Muslim terrorist in the kitchen. Yeah, he was called Darren Barrett. He was doing 40 years. He was one of uh, head of Al Qaeda in the UK. And yeah, uh, someone just came. I was seeing a pan, pan of hot oil bubbling away, and I was thinking, what's going on here? And yeah, I just seen the lad come in, pick it up, and just tip it over the back of his head when he was standing washing the dishes in the sink. And yeah, right. uh, I just looked over and I seen the skin peeling off the back of his head and all of his hair falling off. And I was like, fucking hell, what's going on here, you know? Scary, isn't it? Oh, I was, I was, yeah. yeah I've, seen, um, I've seen in Stafford something similar. It was <coughs> like a jug of boiling water with a bag of sugar in it. And it was just throwing some kid's face. And it's stuck, it sticks to you. Oh, you know, you can throw water, but when you've got the sugar in it, it's just like, it just peels your face. Wow. You know, there's some horrible ways of getting hurt in prison, isn't it? They've, they've devised some, some, some brutal... Oh, they do, yeah. Brutal, violent kind of uh, attacks on people with razor blades, double... Doubled up, or Doubles up, but you can't stitch you. Double Mars bar. Double Mars bar. You can't <laughs> stitch them, can you? No. It's just impossible, you know, the way they, they cut them. So how did you feel after that? What was that experience for you like? Did it, did it, was, it knock you? It didn't really, like I say, because of the way of my mindset I was in, that it just, just didn't phase us at all. No. But... What it, what the feeling afterwards, the tension on the wing, it was just like, that was like a scary part, you know, because... Did he have a lot of backup? He had to see what happens in them dispersals and that, because it doesn't matter if you're a terrorist or not, he's because he's Muslim, they all stick together. So yeah. it was like, the gangs. they all got together and then there was like a big standoff on the wing and it was like... You've got to watch your back, you know, because people in them places, they're not just going to come over and give you, obviously, the people that don't, they're not just going to give you a slap. Kill you, They're going to fucking kill you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Did you ever come across anyone who lost a life whilst away? Not not anyone that actually physically lost a life, but nearly, like, very close to it. Again, there was another altercation on the wing um, between a... A lad from down the road, a Muslim um, black lad, and one of the lads from up in Franklin, he's from Middlesbrough, the kid. Yeah. Um, they were having a bit of argument on the wing, and the the lad just come running up, picking him up, and rugby slamming him off the floor upside down on his head. And a few of the other ones have come up running over, and they've all stamped all over his head. And uh, he was nearly a cabbage, to be honest, after that. We've seen him about two weeks later coming through a visit. And he was hobbling through like an old man and his head was just black and blue. The whole, the whole thing was black and blue and he was never the same after that, to be honest. Like, no, I can imagine. You know what I mean? Did you ever come across anyone notorious in Franklin? Because that's... Yeah, there was loads, like I said, um, like I said, when I landed there and I was like thinking, I was like ill meet element and stuff. Yeah, you're going like, to meet some You're gonna meet some major criminals, aren't you? Oh, there was some, yeah. Uh, to name a few, I mean, there was a load, load from Downless and a load of Scousers up there. And there are some of the Scousers that I've come across, the, they just don't give a fuck the Scousers, like the <laughs> fucking game is out. <laughs> you stick together as well, don't <laughs> they? Do we? I? Yeah, it's one thing they do, is uh, collectively we stick together. Oh, know, the most of that. I'm remembering that from the YPs, where it was like in uh, Hindley, and you had the Manx and the Scousers on one wing, and you know we always stuck together. You know, Not so much outside, but oh, you know, only in. Oh, they definitely stick together, like, yeah. opening my eyes up, you thought people up my end stuck together, but mm. the Scousers just took it to the next level, like, with the dangerous fuckers as well. <laughs> <laughs> but um, a couple of the couple of names that I'll mention that was up there was uh, Colin Gunn from Nottingham. He was a yeah. big, heavy bloke, him and his brother was up there, Dave. Yeah, proper serious gangsters. Um, yeah, from Nottingham? But, yeah, from Nottingham. Yeah. But, yeah... Uh, on the same note, they're good blokes as well. Not to talk to, we get on with them. Like up in Franklin, like I say, the majority of the time you don't really see much trouble because everyone's just getting on with each other. But obviously, when it kicks off, it like it goes off properly, you know. Yeah, that's it's but, like yeah. it's like one of those. I know from from like my experience of being in prison. You know, you go from like 
my mind. And then that's when they decide on your sentence where you go, whether it's a dispersal, you know, you're going to ma- maintain your, your sentence in a local or you're going to go to a cat C and then that way I ended up. Because I only ever had small sentences at the time, I was always in like cat C's, but I was in like the bottom of the barrel of the cat C's, like Stafford. Stafford Prison back then was like, it was a nightmare, it was ruthless, you know, it's probably worse than some of these dispersals. It was 23 and a half hour bang up constantly, and that was back then, never mind during the lockdown, you know. So you spent uh, how long? In yeah. in Franklin, I was in there for, for three years, but um, another, uh, Kev Lane, who's just been on your show. Kev, was he there? Did you bump into Kevin? He was in there with us, oh yeah. Big shout out to Kev. Big shout out, Kev. Had yeah, a, uh, also, while I'm on the shout outs, because I'll forget, the shout out to Dave, DT Yuzu, supports me with this, uh, the use of the room, and, and Daryl Laycock. And Daryl, yeah. He knows a man. <laughs> he said, you better shout him out. <laughs> there you go, Daryl. Hi, thanks, Daryl. Cheers for coming to me, book launch as well, mate. Yeah, good kid, Daryl. Yeah, so Kev Lane, good kid. Love Kevin. Kev, I'll see him next week. Had a uh, had a few laughs with Kevin Franklin, had a few drinks with him as well. Yeah, the huge. The huge guy, yeah. The kid that was in the pod next door to Kev, some uh, Irish fella, Rob. He used to brew the hooch up for everyone. Strongest stuff you could get, yeah. Yeah. Have one cup of that and you were you were wiped out like... It's crazy, isn't it, how, how, how strong it is? Oh, I, but uh, in Franklin, I mean, it got to the point where... I was having to knock the drink back. There was that much happening, like, because yeah. I was banging, starting to get well into my gym and stuff. And they have come back from the gym. The lads are seeing how, and I'm seeing like, <laughs> I'm having a night off the night. You know what I mean? Up with an hangover. <laughs> yeah. But um, they, I sort of see them before when I was seeing like I didn't regret prison medicine. I am like, some of the rare, I had some proper good laughs in there. I mean, didn't get us wrong. I had a lot of bad times in there, depressive yeah. uh, moods and all that. But in Franklin, had a like I see one of the parties, we had a party one Christmas and everyone was off their heads. It was mad. <laughs> like, tunes were pumping out. Kev screws, Leon, not, screws not giving a fuck. Screws were uh, I remember uh, there was one screw from down off the non-swings. All the other screws were cushioned. He came walking past the pod and he popped his head in. There was about 10 of us in the pod and about eight of them were in for murder doing 30 year sentences. And he says, what's going on here? Like... And he says, yeah, he looked down, he seen a bucket full of hooch on the floor. So he was trying to have a go, man. The lad says, I'll tell you what, do yourself a favour and fuck off. <laughs> so he walked down the wing and he said to the other screws, he says, if you see what's going on in here, and they said, look, just leave them. <laughs> They're not causing no trouble. Just leave them and let them go back to the you pods. Know, you know what? It's, it, it's, it's so true, isn't it? Because I don't think the screws went any trouble themselves. <laughs> They're outnumbered for the kick-off. You know, they could do without the as <laughs> Back in back back in the day, it was um, there was loads of like uh, easy like moves and that. You know, there was stuff, but yeah, I wouldn't like to be a screw working in a prison ship. No chance. No, not the shit that they're getting now. You know, especially uh, there's a lot of young 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 recruits coming through the ranks now, and they're just naive, gullible, and it's very different from what it used to be like so you've, you've gone through your sentence this is what I read a little bit about say, when you got released you, you ended up doing five years yeah so when did you find out you were getting released how was that so you've gone past your four years Sarah. talk about that first well but the, when I was in Franklin going back to then I, um, I, I think I spent about three years in Franklin hmm. and um, like I was seeing when I was on about the drinking and stuff I um, I was still in that mindset when I was in Frank, when I was having a drink, it was changing me thoughts and way of thinking and that. I was still feeling like, sort of like them violent thoughts and that. And that's yeah. when I thought myself, like I need to sort myself out and change myself. And that's, yeah. uh, I, I went and done a six month drink and, dr- uh, sorry, drug and alcohol course. And that was like an intense every day course. And it was talking about issues in the past, different things and, opening up about your problems and that's when after I'd done that course I started feeling different started changing did you start to heal by the, by the sound you started to heal from the trauma that you'd experienced growing up I did I I, um, I was talking a lot about 
things that had happened, like with my dad and all that, with different things, what he done in the prison or not. Um, because I never really spoke about it, but then when I was opening up about it, I felt like it was getting easier. So it was definitely the best thing to do was talking. If anyone's ever yeah. got issues, problems, you need to talk about yeah, them. Yeah, because uh, you know that's so true. Because for me, I kept it all in for years and blamed everyone. You know, it wasn't my fault. It was you, and I was bitter and resentful. And I never took ownership of it, anything. I didn't take responsibility. You know, the moment I didn't surrender and put my hands up and say, yeah, okay, look, I've got a problem. I need some help. And I talked to someone about it. Yeah. Things started to, to change and I started to move along life a little bit better. But you're all showed, didn't you? I read somewhere that you, you come across your dad whilst in prison. You spend a bit of time with you. How was that? Well, my dad was actually in Franklin when I got there. And he, uh, we were up both on the same wing together. And he, uh, obviously when I'd done that course and I was on the wing with my dad and speaking with my dad and stuff, yeah, uh, it definitely helped us progress as well. How was that? Being bangs, what was your dad? Seriously, come on. Well, it was mad, but that was another thing that led us to prison as well because I was 18 year old uh, when my dad got lifed off. And then that just sent me mind into... Worse, you know, I just went downhill even more. Yeah. And again, coming back to them thoughts of always wanting to go to prison, there's my dad back in prison. So in my mindset, I wanted to be in prison with him and I wanted to go to Franklin. So I remember he used to go on the visit, visit my dad in Franklin. And then next thing I know, I'm actually in the prison with me dad. But yeah, uh, again, like, that's what I was wanting in my head and that's what I got. I got there, I achieved it. Yeah. So... At the time, I was was mad. I can imagine. I, can. I remember um, speaking with John Burton uh, a while back, and he was locked up with his dad. His dad got arrested. He was he was in the same shell as him overnight. His dad got arrested because of him, and spent never being away. So it was a different different uh, kind of situation. But he said that it was so sad for him yeah. to um, to be in that cell with his dad. Yeah, so. Talk about um, your tariff. So your tariff is that a four now? Yeah. Right, and you're going past that. Where, where, what are you thinking? Well, uh, what happened was after I'd done that six month drug and alcohol course, I got cut C. So that was one of your uh, your goals to get that out the way first. Yeah. Yeah, because they give it a little bit of a target, don't they? Oh, do I? <laughs> like obviously with the IPP, yeah. when it's years ninety nine year. You've got all these courses to go through, haven't you? Oh. <laughs> Yeah, they, yeah. If you on. don't hit you, if you don't do these courses, you don't keep your head down, and obviously. So you did you do the restorative justice one? And sorry. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, no, I didn't do that one. No, no it was one of mine. That uh, no, that wasn't one of my that objectives. Was bit, that was a bit biblical for me. <laughs> 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 I felt like it was just you know sitting <clears throat> there reading the Bible. You know, it was basically stuff that I knew. But yeah, it was one of the courses I had to do. So you got this drug and alcohol course out the way. Yeah. That's when I got here. Uh, I got cut scene, then I got moved up there. Uh, it was Ackleton, which is now HMP Northumberland. Yeah. Yeah, and that's when I was at the four year mark. And that's when I seriously started thinking about what I wanted in life because I thought, well, I'm at that point now where I'm eligible for parole. So I need to like think about my future and think about what I wanted. So by this point, I was in a totally different mindset to what I was beforehand. Yeah. I wasn't wanting what I used to want. I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was that same person. I wasn't violent. I wasn't aggressive. I didn't want to, uh, I wasn't wanting to hurt people. I was wanting to make a better life for myself. Yeah. So uh, I remember sitting contemplating uh, and my wife, who I'm with now, yeah, she was she stuck by us through my IPP. So I remember one night I thought, all these things that I was thinking, I just thought I need to write this down in a letter and tell her. Yeah. So I wrote it all down, sent her the letter, tell her that I wanted to be with her, loved her or not. Yeah. She was coming up on visit still. She got the letter, I think she was quite shocked. And she uh, she wrote back saying she felt the same. Yeah. So uh, it was about a year later, she was still coming up on visits. That's when I got released. Yeah. After five years, like I say, with a total different mindset, because in my mind, I wanted kids. I had some money. 
yeah, unfortunately, my grandma passed away when I was in there, but he left us a lump sum inheritance, and I thought, I want to put this to good use. Yeah. So I had everything outside waiting for us, really, to start my new life. So although you'd lost your granddad, you landed on your feet at the same time. I did, I. You know, you've got a, a girl that loves you, you love her, things are going to change, you want to plan a future, have yeah. kids, show everything on the horizon. You've had, you've done your sense since you've reflected on it. Yeah. You've obviously changed during that time. As you spoke about, which, yeah. and now you're outside. What's going on then? So I get out. I moves in with my girlfriend. Yeah, I've said this before. Yeah, my wife says, "Don't say it again." But I got off pregnant on the first day. <laughs> What's your wife's name? <laughs> Michaela. Michaela. How are you, kid? <laughs> but yeah, yeah, everything was going well. We're both. I was 25 years old. My wife's the same age as us. Yeah. We're both. Yeah. Uh, like loves your dream, you know, just loving life, being free. My wife say uh, going to work. I was going to the gym on a morning, and yeah, uh, within about two weeks, I bought a burger van because I seen the burger van was on a plot where they were going to build a school in a year's time. So I knew that. So I bought the burger van. Thinking ahead, there, one. Thinking ahead, I. <laughs> Kids love. It's in a time, don't they? <laughs> but yeah, uh, I was thinking about the workmen as well on yeah. the building site. So it took two years to build there. To build the actual school, so I ended up getting a cafe on the building site. Oh, aye. So I'd done all right with that. Um, had another kid in the meantime, my little daughter, Kira. So you got two now? So I've got two now. Two daughters? No, I'm the oldest son, Ricky. Ricky, little Ricky. Little Ricky, aye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Kira came along, and then uh, the school was built, and I'd made enough money off that. I bought a cafe on an industrial estate. Yeah. I was also doing car valeting at the time, so I had I was setting the cafe up on a morning. Yeah, couple, had a couple of lasses in it working for us. Then I was going out during the day doing the car valeting, travelling all over the northeast. Yeah, um, and then eventually them two businesses, they start opening up all the car washes all over the place, yeah. not the hand car washes. And uh, they wasn't doing too well with the cafe, so I sold both of them businesses up. Um, bought a car business, buying and selling cars, got me sell a recovery truck. I started doing all right with that, going down the auctions and stuff. Things were still uh, going all right. And in them years, we ended up having another two kids, so we ended up having four kids all together. Wow. Yeah, uh, and we moved into uh, the house that I grew up in, because my mum had four, uh, us three kids. But you've just got piles of dishes and washing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you have <laughs> I'm fed up a bit, lad. <laughs> dishes, wa- dishes and washing and beds not getting made and she's constantly <laughs> telling them to do something. Well, she's watching it, by the way. Anyway, so, yeah, moving on. So, I, um, like I see over the next 10 years, I ended up getting married, had four kids. But things weren't always... Things didn't all go to plan. Well, not, not to plan... It was a few things along the way, experiencing deaths and stuff. Um, the first one was, well, the first suicide was my best friend. The only one that truly stuck by is through my prison sentence as well on the first one. Uh, my friend, since 11 year old, he was suffering silently with mental health. Um, and he was ringing us up during the day. Like his head was up his arse and that, and I said to him, look, I'll come up later on, see ya. So I was ringing him back to go and see him, and he wasn't answering. So I rang my other friend, and we both went up, went to his door, went and got his brother, and we're banging on the door, and I could hear keys rattling on the other side of the door, so I knew he was in the house. So I started booting the door, but it was one of them big composite doors, and it just wasn't budging, but I was thinking, I knew he was behind, I knew he was in the house, you know, so I... I just stepped back, booted the door with all, everything I had in the door, just come flying off. Went running up the stairs because he lived in an upstairs flat, checking in every room. I was thinking, oh, he's not here. And then there was one door, one bedroom door shut. Yeah, and I pushed the door open and he was there. Yeah, he was on the back of the door, hanging. Yeah, I had to cut him down, give him mouth to mouth, try and resuscitate him for, for 20 minutes till the ambulance and that got there. Um, and that just fucked me head right up. That my head was just done in. No, I'm not half so made. I started here. Yeah. Yeah. So when I started drinking again, started drinking heavily and that, just to try and block it out. And 
couple of years after that, another, um, sorry, it was my wife's auntie. She committed suicide as well, done the same thing, hung herself. And then not long after that, another of my best friends done the exact same thing, hung himself. And like my head was just fucked up and I was, just went into a like mad depressive and like, you're going through a lot of loss here, aren't you? Oh, it was too much at the time, you know. It's overwhelming. Even, so listening, to, even listening to it, mate, I yeah. know. You know, I've got a few friends that have uh, committed suicide, and it's so sad, it it's so heartbreaking. But I, I, you know, you actually, you were there cutting them down. That was, that's another story. Powerful. Oh, it was devastating, now. Yeah. Took a lot. Took us. Wait, I'm still not over it now, but I mean, like, took us... Can you ever get over something like that? No, I can never get over it, but you've just got to learn to manage your emotions and learn to deal with it and just not... Just coping, in it? And not deal with it the wrong way, which I started doing again. And yeah. like I say, I was, like, drinking bottles of vodka and that and just sitting fucking mortal drunk mess, you know, crying my eyes out, to, like, going over it in my head. Yeah, but now, obviously, when I got recalled and all that... That was when I changed my mindset, you know, because when I went into prison. So tell us about why you got <clears> recalled, <throat> so the viewers get to yeah. understand a little bit about why. So what happened was, like I said, I'd been out nearly 10 years without being in any trouble or anything with the police, not in the uh, I'd sitting in the house one night, had a few drinks, uh, and someone had rang us up. It was just through Facebook Messenger. Obviously, because I advertise all my cars on Facebook, everyone knows I buy and sell cars. And I got offered a stolen car at like a ridiculously cheap price. And yeah. Uh, Did you know it was stolen? He tell as he said it was, I knew it was stolen, you know. And yeah, uh, I'd never done out like that before, but I thought, had a couple of drinks, lost me inhibitions and that, and I just thought, you know, I could make a few quid on this. So it was something that I thought was going to be easy, a couple of easy, a couple of hundred quid, turn it up being another one of the biggest mistakes of my life because I ended up losing everything over it. What was it? What kind of car? Was it worth it? No, it wasn't worth it at all. It was worth what I'd done. I was thinking it was going to be worth it. Yeah. So what yeah. I'm saying, I'm thinking, is it a... It was a brand new motor. Yeah. yeah. It only not long came out. Had the keys and everything with it. I was thinking... I knew someone from the auctions that had mentioned it before. Yeah. So... Ring it. I'd rang this person up and they said, aye, I'll take it. So on my way to drop the car off, obviously, like I said, I'd had a couple of drinks and I'd end up getting a puncher on the car instead of stopping and I've kept on driving the car. And then I've went up a back street, I've seen police lights behind us and I'm thinking, shit, they're coming after me, you know? So I've took off up a back street, put my foot down. And then when I've went to brake, because I'd been driving so long on a flat tire, the brakes weren't working. And I've just went smashing straight in the back of a parked car. Yeah airbags went off I'm stunned a bit and I'm thinking fuck and I've just panicked jumped out the car and just legged it ran off and nothing came back yeah, um, it was six months later I was in my recovery truck on my way to work on my way to pick a car up and I seen like because it was in my local area seen a cop car go past I seen them stare and I was thinking someone's not right here and I seen one of them following us but uh, the reason they were followed is they didn't pull us, they, they were calling for backup. Obviously, when you've got violence on your record using weapons, they've got to call for backup. And next thing I know, there's like 10 busy cars behind us flashing lights. And I'm thinking, what the fuck's going on here? Like, you know what I mean? So, so I have a Miami Vice. <laughs> all boxed us in, all yeah. that. Uh, chucked us in the back of the police car. I see us, what's going on? They said, just get in the back of the car. And then we'll tell you. So I've sat us in the back, hadn't read as me right, so I was thinking, what the fuck's going on here? And they said, yeah, oh, you, you wanted for recall to prison? And I was just like, the whole world fell apart, stuck in the truck is in the back of the rear, ride van. And uh, when you're getting recalled to prison, you don't... You don't even go to court, you? Do don't you? go to court, I know, you just... So did, did they charge you with anything? Did you recall you? It was recalled. They, um, the, what happened was the police have phoned probation up tell them about the car yeah said he's been involved in this but the charge is it sounds actually worse than what it is because if you if you crash a stolen car it's called aggravated vehicle taking yeah so even when i was in durham police station they took us to durham police station 
Anything aggravated, the, it's like it's, it's heavy, isn't it? Yeah. They just see any, um, they weren't even seeing what it was for, they just seeing odds for recall. I didn't even find out until I was in Durham prison. They said aggravated vehicle take, and I was thinking aggravated. I thought aggravated vehicle take was like when you've ripped someone out of a car yeah, or something. Yeah, and, yeah. But the aggravating feature is you've crashed the car and you've damaged it. So that's. So I'm back in prison. I was there. I was in the gym half nine in the morning, training. Half an uh, six hours later, sitting in Durham prison. Didn't even, like I said, didn't even go to court. Just drove straight through the police, uh, the prison gates. Sitting back on the remand wing, but I was in 10 years previously. And my head was just up my arse, I was thinking. But at first I was thinking, oh, I'll probably only be in 28 day, 28 day recall, but IPP, it's totally different. It's like, it's at least six months when Didn't you're Didn't you know in. that at first, no? I got tilt that, but when I was in Durham, you they haven't got a clue. No. Yeah, the Did they say oh, 28 days? The says yeah. I might be back out in 28 days, but I think deep down I was just, I knew it wasn't, but I was clinging to that bit of hope that it was going to be that. And you've got four kids on the outside, a wife, yeah, and you're shitting in a shell. Four kids and a wife, I'm, I'm back there, and I'm just, couldn't believe the situation I was back in. I was just thinking, what the, you know, what the fuck, and what have I done? Yeah. Like I'd lost everything. I was thinking I've lost my wife, lost my kids. I know I'd have them back, but temporarily, lost my business, all for a, a daft mistake again. You know. Mm. So tell us about what happened whilst you were away, because this book, you did this while you were away yeah. on that last sentence. Tell us why you wrote it. The reason I wrote the book, I um, I've trained since I went to prison when I was twenty. When I got my IPP, tw- uh, sixteen years I've been training for now. And uh, I went back into prison, I got a job on the surgery, and I was just lifting weights, and I went back up to 19 stone, Wow! and I just felt, I felt good, everyone's looking at you thinking, fucking hell, look at the size of him, you know what I mean? Getting that reputation on the wing, people looking at you, and they... Because you're a big kid, you're six foot four as well, aren't you? So 19 stone on that frame, you know, it's going to look like a massive unit. But it... When I went on the yard and done a little bit of uh, fitness, I just felt unfit, and I thought, oh, <laughs> you know, when you get to, when you get to this age, it's not about it's not yeah. about being the biggest and the, the well, baddest easy. looking. It's about <laughs> being fit. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're fucking lasting five minutes, are you? <laughs> I know. Well, some of these you sheds out there, he was just like massive, but I haven't got a, a second in them. No. Right. So I went out on the yard, done a circuit, and like I see that's when I thought myself. Plus, we just got locked down because of the COVID, so we're on 23-hour lockdown. Yeah. And yeah, we're getting one hour a day out of our cells. And I'd just seen, I was looking around and they just, everyone just started deteriorating and the mental health. And yeah. The things started to change <clears throat> during the lockdown, the first COVID lockdown. Did, did, did you see a whole different kind of attitude to, to, to the prisoners' behaviour? Oh, yeah, like I say, you've got an hour a day out of your pad, but there's like a, on a house block, there's 180 lads, and they've got to try and social distance everyone, so sometimes you might be getting half an hour, 45 minutes at first out of your pad, and dear, and they've got to try and split that up throughout the day, so if your association is at 8.30 in the morning, yeah. if you're not sleeping through the night because of mental health problems or whatever, and you miss that half eighty slot in the morning. You don't get it again. You don't get it again, but then your next slot is not till the next afternoon or half three. So you're doing like thirty odd hours bang up before you're back out on the yard for a bit of fresh air. And everyone was just doom and gloom, obviously. But you you would be anyway, I was myself. But I just thought myself like I need to change this mindset and turn it into a positive, you know. So I started every day just fanatically out on the yard, just burpees everything just circuits every day and over six months was I'll, you the only one doing this i w- there was a couple of us doing it but i was like i'll be going around spurring the other lads yeah. on knocking on the door saying how will lads get yourself out yeah encouraging them today uh, improve the self-esteem and the confidence isn't it yeah it's some fucking blood running around the body oh exactly because a few of the lads i knew of previous sentences and a few of them i knew from my home area and I could just see the way they were going as well. And I was just like encouraging them because it was making me feel good about myself helping them, you know? Yeah. So I was getting them out on the yard and over a period of about six months, I lost two and a half stone. I went down to 
16 and a half stone and I felt the fittest I've ever felt yeah. and um, but I wasn't at the time the reason on about the mental health I started suffering mental health when I was in prison I did on the first when I first went in off my IPP when I was 20 yeah, I was suffering these I was having, experiencing these feelings didn't know what it was at first going back when I was 20 and it wasn't until I went and seen a doctor he says the feelings that you're having is like anxiety panic attacks and I felt when I was training the more I trained and the harder I trained I got rid of these feelings and it helped us sleep at night yeah because I wasn't sleeping through the night and that yeah, um, so like I said, lost, went down to 16 and a half stone. And because I was helping other people on the wing and started feeling good about myself, I thought, I'm going to start jotting these ideas down. I'm going to, I was thinking about writing a book. Mm. So I thought, no, nah, instead of thinking it, just do it, you know. So I started writing it down and it just started coming to us. Before I knew it, I'd wrote like 100 pages. And uh, obviously it was occupying me time as well when I banged up that long. And it was giving me something to focus on. And like I say, I've, I've always had like a business head on as a bit of an entrepreneur. Yeah. So uh, I was sitting there and I thought, you know, I've lost one business, lost my car business. And I, could, I was on creating another business. And that's what I was thinking in my head. I thought, you know, I, I could make a, instead of sitting here, just getting depressed and not doing anything with me time, I could turn this into a business, you know. So I wrote the book. And it uh, took us about eight months to write the book. And then, obviously, once I got released, I'd do, I'd end up spending 13 months back in. And then as soon as I got out, I just had that ambition still, and I just started typing the book up straight away the second day I was out. Yeah, it's got a lot of diagrams in it as well, because I yeah. was reading it, the, what the first one you said that said that. So there's a lot of information, you know, so... You've put a lot of work into this, haven't you? Yeah, I've put a lot of work into it. It's uh, it demonstrates, it's got illustrations of how to do every single body weight exercise. Yeah. And it's got demonstrates every single weight exercise. I was reading a bit about like water weights and, you know, because yeah. we used to do that with ourselves, tens of beans yeah. in pillar cases, you know, and yeah. just um, go for it. I remember being banged up with this kid from a... Uh, from sort of Newcastle ways, uh, Paul Donaldson, I don't know whether I should have mentioned his name there, but to be honest, uh, Paul, he was all right. Um, and we used to like train crazy, you know, in the pad together, do a lot of uh, like press ups, shit ups, a lot. I remember writing to Charlie Bronson after I used to do 2,000 press ups, right, in my pad. I wrote to him and said, Look, I've done over 2,000 press ups in my pad. I beat your records. <laughs> right. I don't know, I think he was in Franklin or Wayfield. It was Wayfield or Rose. I read about him in the FATM magazine. It's it's seen. It was like I was the same as yourself. Yeah. I used to look up to all these these crazy uh, criminals and um, you know back to me. Said back in Elsh Cow, she made it in May, mate. Not mine. <laughs> My son is from Liverpool. Um it was he wrote back to me with a with a picture of some crazy face with a camera sticking out of his head. But yeah. You know, there's nothing if you've got nothing better to do then take care of yourself. So you've have you you just sort of documented everything yeah. you've done and put it in a book. And how did that make you feel? It made us feel uh, really good, you know, because uh, when I was writing it all down, the reasons why I was doing it as well, I was looking back. At first I was just gonna base it on body weight exercises, the way that I got myself extremely fit and lost all that weight mm. and I was but don't you think the first bit of weight you lose anyway when you put it on is easy to come off it's the uh, it's the other weight isn't it that I struggle yeah. with see I've, I've been up to like a big weight 17, 18 stone and then I've gone down to 16 yeah. but I haven't gone past that 16 right, all right. the only way I've gone past that is then I've had to go take it to a little bit more to the extreme on the intermittent fasting I was doing yeah. that when I was away uh, I think it was 16, 8 the hours that I was doing and then I took a stone off again, down to 15 stone from 17, 8. Yeah. Which was incredible. But then it's, it just keeps back up again. <laughs> <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to keep at it, haven't you? Like, yeah. You've got to it, do but, it because it's, it's You know what, right? If you do it constantly all the time, you'll never have a, you'll never enjoy your life because yeah. you're never enjoying any kind of good food. Now I'm on this, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of eating really <clears> well. <throat> Not a new year, new me. Just 
because I don't believe in all that New Year resolution stuff because it goes yeah. out the window in the first couple of weeks. What I, what, I, what I do believe is like having a balance and saying and enjoy your life because we're not here for a long time, but we're here for a good time. Not you so. know. But I'm, you know, it's pretty impressive, you know, some of the stuff that you've read. And I've, I've actually gone through it when I was at home and it just reminded me what it was like. Yeah. You know, and how much I felt better about myself after I trained in a shell because you can imagine it's just an hour in your pad out of them 24 doing a workout it, the next 23 you're flying through you know what I mean oh it makes you feel much better doesn't it like yeah so what was your aim what was your goal tell us a little bit about what your agenda is my aim f- for the book and was like I said when I first went in as well it was all about doing like weightlifting exercises get as big as possible and what i was wanting to do at first the book was just going to be aimed at prisoners obviously because that's where i was at the time yeah and the more i started writing the book because it's not just talking about the training side of it it's on about mental health and all that and how it betters you and um i just yeah just lost my train of thought there we are <laughs> Bad, bad no, sorry, yourself. that was it. I, um, yeah. It wasn't just, I was thinking to myself, this book's not just aimed at prisoners. It's uh, people sitting at home feeling like prisoners trapped in their own thoughts. Well, I read something that Razor, Razor, no. Noel Smith, I. Noel Smith. You've done a, an interview for the Inside Times. Yeah. Did you? Did, you know, so I read the story. And he also asked that same question. You know, is it this just yeah. aimed at inmates? But. I believe after reading your answer, it was aimed at anyone that was in lockdown, whether yeah. they're locked down in their own house, in their own mind, you know, because people yeah. feel quite insecure about going to gyms or it's quite daunting leaving the house. You know, and the best thing to, you know, guidance that you're offering there is you can do this in the house and you can feel yeah. good about yourself. Then you can go and take that step to the gym or you can just take that step out the door and go for a walk. Is that what you were aiming for eventually? It is. That's exactly what I'm aiming for. And like, since I've got out of prison and I've finished the book and people's read it, like the feedback that I'm getting off it is just like amazing, you know? People's like giving us feedback, saying this. I actually got a message on Saturday of a person up my end area. He says he's going through the worst time possible. And he says, if it wasn't for your book, I wouldn't be messaging you now. Isn't that amazing? And like, it's making us feel our tingly new tartan. We're like, oh, you know, it's uh, getting goosebumps. How powerful, I don't know what it is, how powerful is that? It's an inspiration that people can send yeah. you a DM, a message and say, you know what? You have contributed to me changing my yeah. life. And you made, I'm thanking you for it. Does it. Did you feel like a bit of an imposter? Because I've had messages saying, you know, Bill, what you're doing with your brother or what you're doing with your life and how you've gone through your journey. It, it, you know, it's an inspiration. It's inspiring. And I go... You know, I just had no choice but to do these things, you know what I mean? I, I offer a service to my family because I've been a disservice. I've been away. I've been a, I've been like a pain in the arse. You know, I, I haven't benefited them in any way or form over the years. I've sat in shells and I've reflected, you know, and I say this to anyone, especially sitting in a shell. Ricky, you know this, mate. Yeah. It's like, if you're not, you know, if you're going to get out and change your life, change your life. And my mate said to me, you only need to change one thing about yourself. I was made up when he said that. I was going like, what is it? <laughs> and he went, you need to change everything. Everything. That's the one thing you need to change. And, and that was my attitude, my behaviour, my thought process. I had to uh, grow up and develop emotionally and more mature in them areas. It's not easy. You, and you're not going to do that. Just stagnating, right? And thinking and not talking about what's going on. And you said that earlier on. You know, the best thing for you was to talk about it. And that's when the change started to happen. Yeah. Okay, you had that 10-year period when you were out. You know, I had a similar experience. I got out and I had 10 years, a decade. I couldn't stay out of prison for three weeks. Yeah. Right, I, I was a recidivist. You know, I never even knew what a recidivist was until I went to prison. And a GM screw went to me, you are a recidivist. <laughs> I had to go back and look it up in the dictionary. And it meant I was an habitual criminal that kept returning to the same spot. Right, so... She spend a decade out and then I got arrested. Goes back to jail. And it's not 
like 10 years later, going back to jail, a lot older, getting calls Uncle Bill <laughs> or Pops. You know, I was thinking, this is not for fucking oh, me no more. Yeah. These kids are crazy. They're all on the spice. None of that was happening when I first went away. You know, they were all on the gear, you know, and it was a bit calmer. But now they're, they're cutting each other up for cards and, you know, it's, oh, it's, just, crazy, it's, just, you know? it's just mental. And, you know, the mental health is drug-induced. A Walton prison, HMP Liverpool, it's fucking crazy. I spent um, I spent most of my last sentence in there. And the last time I was there, I was on the roof. So going back 16 years later, you know, it was a different, it was a different ball game. Younger screws, uh, younger inmates who were more violent and, and gangs and they couldn't go to one wing and that wing and they couldn't go to visits because they had beef with this person. You know, it's, it's, it's just a fucking horrible world to live in. You know, and I know as well as yourself, that it's not it's not beneficial for some people, especially with mental health getting locked up twenty four hours a day, twenty three hours a day. Am I right? Oh, definitely. Where it's like some of the people like you see in there. Like when I first went back into home house, like when I went to home house, sorry, because I'd never been in that prison before. Been in every prison in the northeast apart from that one. Uh, I went on a house block five, and I landed there and I looked around. I thought, is this a fucking hospital wing? <laughs> I exactly. Don't want their health. Exactly. Like you're looking around, I thought, wow. Like everyone is just fucked up in there on that like you see on that space. It's just All the old cons have gone. You know, all the um I mean that it is a different it's a different generation now that it, that's in there. And it's a totally fucked up one. And like <laughs> I was laughing when you said because I walked on my first wing and it was like, is this a this an Aussie wing? People were selling the roasties for spice. They were selling the <laughs> clobber, soap, toothpaste, anything you can get the, their hands on. They were selling it, banging at your door, begging you, pleading you. I was thinking, fucking hell, this is nuts. This is fucking mental. <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, I don't want to go back ever. You know, I've got a family now. Um, I believe I've kind of grew up a lot more. I'm too old for it. That's not the reason why. Yeah. It's just that you can still be at a certain age in your life. I know people who are still like in the 50s, 60s, and they're still going to jail. They haven't changed. And they've been going all their life. You know, you have to change, you know, at one point. And do you believe this is how to change? It's definitely helped me change. Like I say, when I went in there because of these suicides that I'd experienced, I was just in a negative mindset and like I wasn't looking at things in a positive way. I was just starting to feel angry and that and just like, so when I went in there and I changed my mindset, I've come out and I wake up now, I'm happy as out. I've got no issues. I'm loving life. Like I'm the happiest I've ever been. And I believe if you change your mindset and act in a positive way, positive things, every good things just come to you. Like everything for me is just falling into place yeah. at the minute and it's just like mental, everything's feeling good, but I'm helping so many people and this is what I'm wanting for the book. I'm trying to get it into the prisons. So if anyone's watching this who's got family in prison, get this book sent into them because it could help change the mindset. This is called Behind the Bars Ruthless Fitness by Ricky Killeen. You can get this in Waterstones. You can get it on Amazon Prime and Waterstones. Brilliant. And, you know, I'd recommend this to anyone who's away. Whether they want to be fit, strong or not, or they want to improve the mental health, this is this is ideal for your son, your daughter. Yeah. It works both ways, doesn't it? Another thing, like it's not, like I see it's not just for prisoners. I've actually, there's a, I've actually now got myself a gym. I've had about six weeks, and a lot of the clients that I've got, uh, kids, and they're one of my clients. He's 15 year old, and he come in for his first PT session back after Christmas, and he had a big cheesy grin on his face, and he said, "One of my Christmas presents was your book." Brilliant. And I'm thinking, like, how does that make you oh, feel? Someone's saying to me, I got your <laughs> book. For, did you go, fuck, I could have got something better. And like, I had the same thing. Someone said to me, you got a book for your Christmas. I'm thinking, fuck, you could have got something better. But they were made up. Oh, they were. But it, it made me feel made up. I thought, you know, like. Yeah, man. I feel. You should be proud of yourself. feel good, you know. You've achieved, you know, you're helping young kids. And you know, this is what we 
as a uh, as grown up individuals should be doing now is like intervening with the youngsters. I feel yeah. anyway, I'm I'm involved in something called Weapons Down Glove Shop. It's all about knife crime, gang culture, county lines. It it goes it goes along the whole line of like drug addiction, mental health stuff that it's lived experience. I've lived it, I've experienced it. I can share my experience and hopefully guide someone on the right path. I'm not here to tell you what to do because it didn't work for me, and my experience is going to be different from yours. So I won't allow mine to cloud my experience to cloud my judgments on your on your pathway. Um, and I get the same. Like response from kids who just do a little bit of exercise, get spoken to like like yeah. not getting spoken down to or feel like they've got someone turning up in a shirt and a clipboard saying, Well, you need to do this and you need to do that. I don't want to look at your door. Because I had that inferior superiority complex for years. You know, if someone had a job and they had a shirt and they had a tie and they were coming down talking to me, I wouldn't listen. It was someone like ourselves. I knocked up my door and went, Bill, get your shit together. What's wrong with you, lad? Come on. You know, there's a way out here. And that's when I listened. It was people like myself. I'm not taking it away from people who've got, you know, academic skills in them areas and have gone to college and universities and, and, and probation office and stuff like that. People have learned this stuff. But there's a difference between, like, yeah. the lived experience and the actual kind of documented experience. Am I right? I totally I am. right. I am, I am. I know I am. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you've got a gym now, Rick. Yeah. Brilliant. Is but it Rick or Ricky? It's Ricky here. Yeah. My gym's Ruthless Fitness. I've got my own clothing brand. Yeah, when I got out, I applied for the copyright for it. Yeah, I've obviously got the Gorilla Head, Ruthless Fitness. Have you got a website? I've got a website. Um, it's behind the bars, Ruthless Fitness. So what I'll do is I'll put all your links anyway in the description. So if you want to follow Ricky, you can, you know, Instagram. Facebook, social media, all his platforms will be in the description. His link to his book, you can get that. Right, Rick, I really enjoyed this, but what I always say, right, is there anything else you need to say? Because if there is, we can carry on. But if there I was, isn't... I was I've, just going to say about the uh, about the gym, like the boxing classes. you got boxing I, classes? I've put boxing classes on for kids. And obviously in my local area, the kids are like looking up to us in a good way. They're not looking up to us because I'm up to bad stuff and they want to be like me. Yeah. The looking up there is because I'm doing good stuff and it's it's good, you know, it's good for the community. Brilliant. But I'm helping the kids and I'm teaching them the way I wished I was taught. Yeah. Because things might have been different, you know. Nice one. And you know what, with that, I always say at the end of my podcast, is there anything that you'd say to a young, a young Ricky Killeen walking through the doors of life? Any words of wisdom, any guidance or advice you'd offer? If so, could you tell us? What I would say is, instead of knocking about the streets with your pals, taking drink and drugs, thinking it's clever, wasting your life away, think of something positive, think of the good things in life that you want, and get yourself into the gym and look after your body. You've only got one body. If you got yourself a Ferrari, you wouldn't fill it full of red diesel, would you? You would look after it, you put the best in it, so... Look after your body, yeah. look after your mind. A healthy body, healthy mind. You can achieve great things in life. So uh, that's what I would say. Like. Brilliant. And with that, thank you. Thank you very much, Weird. Thanks, Thanks for having us.